Which past Oregon running back does Dante Dowdell most remind Max Torres of Sports Illustrated of? We'll talk about that, plus all the latest recruiting news for the Ducks as Dan Lanning and company continue to hit the trail for 2023. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view. If you're watching on YouTube every day, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks every single weekday. This episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Those of you watching on YouTube can see I'm not in my normal home studio. I'm visiting my parents for a couple of weeks in the great Pacific Northwest. So I am coming to you live from Edmonds, Washington and my dad's home office that I'm temporarily borrowing. And I hope he doesn't need for a little while, but uh, the guy that's with me today, Max Torres is in his same usual setup down, uh, down in Eugene, if I'm not mistaken. And he covers the ducks for sports Illustrated. is all tied in on the recruiting trail. Max, good to have you back, my man. Hey Spencer, always a good time to, to chop it up with you. Excited to talk about the ducks as always. And they have had some news on the recruiting trail, which is exactly what fans always want to hear at this point in the calendar, because we don't have spring football to talk about. We don't have real football to talk about. And, you know, baseball and softball are going on. They're about to hit the the, the playoff portion of their schedule. We'll see if anything worthy of note happens there. But uh, something worthy of note definitely did happen when football got a commitment from 2023 four-star running back Dante Dowdell. He, he's a big 6'1". Uh, depending on where you look, he's listed at 207, 220. Like he, he's a big, physical, bruising br- bruising back. So uh, before we get to the recruiting ramifications there, I, I just want to ask you, Max, of all the Oregon running backs that, that you have seen and actually been able to watch, right? I'm not expecting to go back to like 80s and 90s or anybody like that. But which Oregon running back does Dowdell remind you of the most? I'd say Dowdell reminds me the most of uh, Royce Freeman, you know, a recent, a recent great uh, coming out of Eugene. Um, maybe a, a little bit of a more obvious comparison, just because their styles maybe align a little bit more directly with both of those guys being kind of uh, bruising backs, like you mentioned earlier. And uh, I think that just the, the physical nature, the physical tone that both of those guys set um, really is is kind of indicative of what we're seeing with Carlos Lachlan and the kind of running backs that he's bringing to Eugene. I think that no Whittington maybe doesn't fit that that full that mold rather, uh, but um, Marquise Bucky Irving definitely does. Um, and, and I think that it's just an exciting sign to see kind of what Carlos Lachlan wants to get out of his running backs. Uh, and then Jordan James, you know, coming out of the state of Tennessee, he's definitely another guy that that I think really carries that physical running style. So Dowdell is no doubt a, a huge get, as I'm sure we're going to talk about here on this episode. Um, but I think that um, it's it's going to be it's going to be a battle to make sure that not only it was a battle to get him committed, but now you have to keep him committed between now and uh, December, seeing if he uh, will even, eventually sign on that dotted line come December. Yeah, it's something else that is a good point to make when you have these 2023 verbal commitments. Uh, not all the time, right? Most of the time that they, they will end up going to the Ducks, but there will be a player here or there where it's kind of, you know, it just it's really, really early in the process or maybe a roster change happens later and he ends up uh, not committing. But this is still someone who Oregon is excited to get and they certainly should be. I like the Royce Freeman comparison. I think you could even go back to maybe like a Jonathan Stewart, Jeremiah Johnson sort of. I, I think Jay Stu was maybe a little smaller, sure. but John, Johnson was, was a pretty big back as well and busted some long runs, which is something Dowdell has the capability of doing and shows that in his high school highlight reels and all, all that stuff. But what do you think it says about the sort of running backs that they want to bring in? I had a great mailbag question here on the show recently about who uh, do coaching staffs amend the roster to fit the scheme or the scheme to fit the roster. And my takeaway is it's mostly roster to fit the scheme because coaches know how they want to run a defense or an offense or anything of the sorts. But 
Now we see all these guys, you know, Jordan James, a lot of stuff between the tackles. You've got Dowdell, who's a big guy, runs primarily between the tackles. You, you don't have a seven McGee, D'Anthony Thomas, I'd say even maybe a, a Byron Marshall type who are just kind of speed demons that are going to kill you on the edge. So Michael and Kenyon fall into that category as well. But what do you think it says about the sort of backs that they want to bring to the Oregon offense? Yeah, I, I think it, it says a lot about just that physical nature uh, of the backs that, that Oregon wants to bring here in the future. Um, I, I was kind of thinking along the lines of, of SEC style, just because you see more of those guys that are just kind of physical freaks that don't just run through you. Um, but I think I really like the mixture of, of styles that the Ducks have right now heading into the 2022 season. If you have to take into account the fact that Dowdell is not going to be with them until the, the 2023 season, right? So you got some bruisers with, with Bucky Irving and uh, Byron Cardwell and then Jordan James, I think falls a little bit under that, but we're going to have to wait until he gets to Eugene and then we see him in fall camp to kind of see what style he maybe falls under a little bit more. And then you have Sean Dollars, who's a little bit more of an all-purpose kind of guy, maybe gives you a little bit more of a value out of the backfield catching the ball. And then Noah Whittington, I think, is, is kind of a little bit more of a um, I almost said dual threat, but I think he presents a little bit more of a receiving option just based off of his frame and how quick he is in and out of his cuts and, and agile coming out of the backfield. So I think moving forward, I think the Ducks are definitely favoring that bruising back for sure um, that, that we've seen be really successful on you know national championship winning teams, whether you look at Georgia or Alabama, I feel, or even, I mean, look at, look at um, Ohio State with Ezekiel Elliott. Um, I feel like they have those tone setting running backs. Um, and I mean, Carlos Lachlan is just going to keep that room stocked and, and he's really proven his value as a, as a, a top tier recruiter or, or, you know, a relationship builder, as I think he likes to call it. Um, so he, he's been one of the, um, you know, best additions to the staff just from a recruiting standpoint since Dan Lanning has taken over in Eugene. Yeah, I'd say the early returns on the staff recruiting trail are, are pretty outstanding at, at this point in time. I'm not that even coached a game, and maybe we'll in position groups or schemes or anything of the sorts, and Duck fans will, you know, have uh, PTSD the Markleo days, or heck, I even say a little bit, not as bad, but you know, Tim DeRuiter, I, I didn't love what he did a season ago. I think this that up. Oregon was last in the Pac-12 and passing out per game a, a season, which is not a statistic you should have when you have multiple caliber players in, in, in your secondary but as Dowdell goes in, in his recruitment there, there's one critical question that that is arguably the impact from his commitment to the Ducks right we'll get to that after I remind you that our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info you can find all the latest odds news and sports developments including this year's basketball playoffs Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoff, esports, and more. That should be playoffs, not playoff. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. I also forgot to plug the Mariners. Go, Mariners. Bet Online, where the game starts. Always got to plug the M's on there. Always, always, always Pacific Northwest kid through and through. Plus, I'm in the state of Washington. Uh, you know, right now as I record this. So, the, the Marin- yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the Mariners vibes are, are real. So Dowdell commits and now Oregon, I think, is really set at the running back position for for several years, depending on departures from the program and injuries. And that's you got Dowdell and Cardwell and Dollars and Irving and Whittington. You look, you're like, those guys all have like three or, you know, two or three years of eligibility left. So it, it's pretty substantial from that point of view. But uh, the biggest thing with Dowdell here is, this is a Mississippi kid, right? It is Oregon went down into SEC country and got a verbal commitment as the only school that was being considered amongst his final four that was not in the South, right? I believe it was Ole Miss, Arkansas, and, and Tennessee, I, I think was the other one. Um, I, I might have that wrong, but I know it was Ole Miss and Arkansas too. And this is a, a guy who went to high school in the state of Mississippi at, at, at Picayune Memorial High School and he decides not to go to Ole Miss, wants to go to the Pac-12. What do you think that says about Oregon and this staff and kind of what they're trying to establish themselves as on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I think it, it kind of gives me uh, vibes reminiscent of the previous staff at Oregon because they, too, attacked the Southeast very, very heavily. It, and to me, it sends a message of 
we're going to go after the best players in the country, regardless of where they are. Um, and the big thing, Spencer, that I think is a little bit different with, with Oregon and some of these SEC schools is a lot of these SEC schools, they're, they're offering these guys in, in the eighth grade and they're getting that jump on their recruitment. So naturally they just have that, that kind of leg up in the relationship. And then you also have to think of the geographical element of things. Um, I, I think back so often to the example I had when I went out to DeSoto High School in the Dallas area last year, you know, the game ends, we're getting some interviews and guys are saying, oh yeah, I'm heading to A&M tomorrow. I'm going up the road to Austin. These guys, these, these recruits can, can so often make it out to these SEC schools so much more easily um, than they can Oregon. It's not a cross country journey. Does that mean that Oregon can't land these guys? Clearly not. We're seeing that in an example such as Dowdell. But I feel like these southeastern schools have a leg up, just geographically speaking. So it speaks even more to the recruiting abilities of the staff. And then certainly Carlos Lachlan, he's a Montgomery, Alabama native. So it doesn't, it's not a huge surprise. I, I felt pretty confident in, in Oregon's chances going into Dowdell's commitment, seeing that Carlos Lachlan's from that area. And then look at the other backs that he's added. Um, you have uh, Jordan James, who's from Tennessee. No, Whittington's an, originally a Georgia guy. So, um, you know, I think that Carlos Lachlan sent a, a loud and clear message that he's going to try to find the best guys regardless of where they're from. And then that really, I think, trickles down to the rest of the staff because you got to think about guys like Tosh Lapoy, who's got some some very good connections, obviously, in the South from his time at Alabama. So I think it, it sends a clear message that Oregon is a contender for guys in the Southeast. I wouldn't say that they're front runners necessarily from the beginning of a lot of these recruitments. But so often, Spencer, we see guys that are announcing a, a top 10, top 7, top 5, and Oregon is that only school, you know, west of the Mississippi or west of Texas. And the only other school that's kind of in that conversation so many times is, is USC. And, and they're clearly uh, getting some good momentum on the recruiting trail. I think they had a DB out of – or DB or linebacker out of Texas commit to them uh, recently. The name's escaping me, but it's – it's uh, I feel like the picture with the recruiting is getting pretty clear as far as who really is uh, a true contender for these guys from the South outside of those SEC programs. And it, it really is trending towards Oregon and, and USC. And it can be an advantage as well. You know, I've talked with John Garcia, the director of recruiting for, for sports illustrated about this. And, you know, he's uh, been very open about how sometimes when you're a team that, that's going after a player, who's not from your geographical area, but you're the only team there. Sometimes that can help a school stand out, right? Is uh, say a guy like Jaden Wayne, who, who's being recruited by, I mean, I, I don't know if LSU is in on him, but let, let's say a player they of that are. caliber. Yeah, yeah, so they are, right? If you have Alabama and LSU, and let's say both are coming off of really successful seasons, there are going to be a lot of similarities there, right? And so differentiating yourself a, as a program might be kind of challenging. You throw Georgia in that mix, as well but then when another school comes in that's not from the south then it, it has a different feel and i think can provide not in every instance of course but can provide a little bit of an allure for a recruit to where he's saying well you know there's this school and this school but boy that that, that one over there that kind of seems new and exciting like i i know what i'm getting here and this one is you know going to be really similar to that one but this school here could could be really different i think that oregon definitely has that with with some of their recruits. Speaking of a, a, a national recruitment that Oregon is in on, Jaden Rashada has been on Oregon's radar. We've talked about him a lot here on the show. Five-star quarterback in the class of 2023, Pittsburgh, California native. He is uh, a very sought, a very highly sought after recruit as, as he should be. His highlight reel is really, really darn impressive. He recently, uh, I was going to say unleashed, but that's like way, way too harsh. <laughs> released. <laughs> he released his list of final seven schools. And Oregon is actually not the only West Coast team on the list. In a shocking turn of events, the California Golden Bears have made the final seven, which riddle me that, Batman. I got I got nothing as to how they're swinging that. I mean, props to Justin Wilcox and their OC Bill Musgrave just for even being in the hunt for a guy like that for a team that has perpetually struggled to score points year in and year out in a conference that isn't known for great defense in the Pac-12. But Rashada is a guy the Ducks are going after very heavily. They're in the final seven. They're expected to be, I, I think, a little bit higher than that. I think right now we could confidently say that 
the Ducks would make a, a top four, certainly a top five if he were to narrow it down or, or if and when he does. So what, what's kind of the, the latest that you've heard on, on the Jaden Rashada front and, and what you make of, of the Ducks going after him? Yeah, I think, you know, optically, that that's one of the things you kind of have to look at as far as the the sequence of events and the timing of everything. Uh, certainly a good thing for Oregon to get him back on campus, especially in the unofficial capacity. So that that's a trip that he's making on his own dime. Um, and then those five official visits become pretty critical in any recruitment, but even more so with a guy of, of Rashada's caliber. Uh, he's only taken one of his five official visits so far. That was, of course, the trip out to Oxford to see the Ole Miss spring game. Uh, I think a lot of people made a lot of that early on because the, the plan was, as far as Oregon was concerned, to get Rashada on campus for the spring game. Got that crazy atmosphere and, and you know, certainly uh, a lot of excitement around Kenny Dillingham's offense. But uh, I was actually able to talk to a source close to Rashada on this, in his recruitment uh, about that trip out to Oregon over the weekend. And from what I was told is, is that it went well, um, you know, got to spend some time with Dan Lanning. And I think that's really important in this recruitment because not only do you want to see a head coach take a personal interest in almost any recruitment, but from Oregon's perspective, they got to get the quarterback position, right? I mean, that is the single most important position for the ducks right now in this 2023 recruiting class, because I feel like so often that's the, the, the difference maker, right, between, you know, I think a, a Rose Bowl caliber team and a playoff caliber team, which is what o Oregon is ultimately shooting for. Um, but uh, I think that that was, that was definitely some, some good stuff to hear for, for Oregon, that the, the visit went well. Um, I think that the having him on campus puts them in a good position to get one of those four remaining official visits. That isn't confirmed at this time, but I think certainly – just getting them on campus and what I've heard about the visit that that pans out well, but um, Florida is another school that has kind of emerged later in this recruitment. And they were in that, that top seven that he released ahead of a June 18th commitment uh, just about a month away. But, but I'm told that they're in a good spot to get an official visit and that they're, they're recruiting him really hard. And then you also have to look at, at a Texas A&M who, who recently offered, that was a dream offer. He said, so, uh, you know, with, with the momentum that they have on the recruiting trail, you got to figure that they have a great shot in this one. Yeah, and it's one that the Duck fans are following closely, and and they should be because he, he's a he's a big-time prospect. And, it, you know, I think that one of the things that, that this staff can do that the previous one did not is develop a quarterback to his full potential. I, I think that Herbert certainly grew – during his time at Oregon with three different head coaches, but he improved every year. I, I think both the statistics, you know, there were also some drops in there with a limited receiving core that, that Oregon had. Um, the statistics would back that up, but the, the eye test certainly does. Like he was a much better player as a senior than he was a, as a freshman. But now that we see what he's become in the NFL, you look back and go, okay, something's left on the table here, right? From a, from an overall production standpoint. So I think that's one area where the staff could really grasp the, the approval of, of the fans for the ducks and say, you know, this is something that, that, that we're able to do. And I don't think they're looking at it as like, Oh, the last staff didn't do this. So we're going to be able to, do it. I think fans are definitely looking at it that way. And I think that's justifiable. And Rashad is the sort of player that, that they'd have the potential to do that with in the future. One guy who he would be throwing the ball to is Kyler Casper, who we'll talk about after I tell you that I love brownies. I mean, who, who doesn't love brownies? I don't make them very often, full disclosure, because if I did, I would just end up eating them all, and that's not good. And you know what I love even is brownie batter. Sometimes I have to – I mean, everybody eats the brownie batter, right? I Man, I could lick that brownie spatula clean and, and get protein in. You're in luck because Built has a new creation is better than ever the brownie batter puff you heard that right this puff takes protein bars to a whole new level and they're available right now on built.com you can go to your brownie batter puffs now off your order with the promo code locked in at built.com uh, so the ducks uh, a while back got uh, another recruiting win and that was kyler casper you know a, a real big body receiver who it is a little bit different than what we've seen from past Oregon wideouts. So what do you what do you make of his commitment and kind of the, the player that he could become for Oregon? 
Yeah, another huge addition is right, Spencer. And I think not only from the the player itself, right? It's always you know uh, dual pronged, I guess you could call it, right? You have the the on field impact and then the recruiting trail impact. And anytime you can get a guy over another SEC team like Tennessee, in this case with with Casper, and then over Ole Miss, like we saw with Dowdell, who's from the state of Mississippi. I think it really speaks volumes to the recruiting acumen of this new Oregon staff, especially when you consider that the volunteers were fresh off that commitment from Nico out of Long Beach Poly in Southern California. I think that says a lot. And then as far as just on the field, I think Casper is an athletic freak. You look at the body of work that he had for Williamsfield High School as, as a junior, I think that you got to be really impressed about that. I think he almost doubled his numbers from his sophomore to his junior season as a guy who's, you know, in that six, five, six, six range, definitely screams matchup nightmare for, uh, you know, a defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator, depending on how you're looking at it. Right. Um, so that's definitely a good ad for junior Adams, who has just really elevated himself as a recruiter during his, his transition from Washington to Oregon. And I think that, he, he adds a, a big boost to this recruiting, this, sorry, this receiver room rather heading into the 2022 season that I think really gave me a lot more confidence throughout the duration of spring ball. I think that Casper projects as a guy who could certainly find himself in the rotation in 2022. And, and I like the, the variety of size and skill sets that Junior Adams has kind of stockpiled with this re- receiving room heading into the 2022 season. Yeah, and the other thing with Casper is he's the sort of receiver that Oregon just hasn't had very many of, right? You think of maybe Devin Williams, Jawan Johnson. Darren uh, Carrington, kind of, maybe. Yeah, yeah, Carrington, maybe. Uh, I think Carrington's a little bit smaller, but he was a 50-50 ball sort of wide sort of Stanford. Yeah, yeah, but Stanford, I feel like, was just never used in, in that sort of way. I mean, I, I think of Casper... And I, I think of those brief moments with Jawan Johnson or Devin Williams where you throw a back shoulder ball on the sideline, right? Herbert did that to Johnson in the Rose Bowl. Anthony Brown hit Williams for that a few times a season ago. And I, I think that when you know, you go back to those Oregon receiver rooms that really weren't very good with Justin Herbert, you did have Jalen Red and Johnny Johnson there. But when they were early in their careers at Oregon, they had a case of the drops and it took them a while to get over that. And I think what this Oregon team has been missing as a program or I'm sorry, as a program uh, for, for the last, for the last 10 years or so is, is that sort of diversity of wide receivers where you have a speedster like seven McGee or Chris Hudson, but you also have, you know, an in-between guy like Chase Coda and Troy Franklin, but then throw out a Kyler Casper, Dante Thornton on the edge. I I think that, that, that does a lot for the offense. Uh, That'll do it for us today. Hopefully tomorrow, I won't look quite so much like Harvey Two Face here, where half of my face is uh, just just a little bit blurred out. I mean, there there are less cool people to to look like, I suppose, on a podcast, right? Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, now, you got you got to work with what you got. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's like one. That's the greatest superhero movie of of all time. That's an entirely different conversation. Maybe we'll have that one day with Max Torres, who covers the Ducks for uh, for Sports Illustrated. Thanks for coming on, as always, my guy. Appreciate you having me. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for making this your first listen, everybody. You can go check me out on a Locked On Pac-12 covering the Conference of Champions for your second listen review of the day. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.